As noted here, this is the Compass Business Series in partnership with the Greater Folsom Partnership, Granite City Coworking, and Tribe. And really our goal here today is to help everyone have meaningful, actionable insights that you can deploy to your business right now. Uh, and of course, as we look to the local community, we have a lot of different businesses. So these first few uh, webinars are gonna be a little bit more focused on breadth. So hopefully there'll be two or three insights every business can take away. And then the upcoming webinars that to follow will be a little bit more focused, including our upcoming one on Friday, which is gonna be specifically around say restaurants, um, which are kind of one of the larger impacted businesses as well. So, you know, with that kind of being stated, the goal of today's webinar is how to react fast and sustain your business. Uh, I've already been in the trenches with a handful of organizations, and what I'm realizing is that it's just really hard to even make that first step. It's kind of catching, catching everyone off guard. And in the organization and kind of the organizational needs, the key is understanding how can we make the next best step and how do we allow ourselves to see some light at the end of the tunnel because there's still a lot of unknowns. So that's really what the goal of the presentation here is today is to help you take a few of those next steps. Uh, so some of this information will be incredibly valuable, some might not pertain, but hopefully you could glean the insights that matter most. So really on our end, it's hopefully we could provide strength and actionable insights, but we also wanna make sure that you have partners here. You have people who are accessible. You have a community that's all coming online. Um, and that's really a larger goal of Compass as well. Um, because we don't really know the timeline of the current situation, we want to ensure that we can still have connections with one another. And of course, a lot of you, a lot of us have been using, say, physical connections, going to networking events, meetings, et cetera. And that really isn't the current norm anymore. So hopefully with these kind of digital and virtual tools, we want to be able to connect everyone. And we think there's a huge way to support everyone here through really exciting technology services as well. Essentially, as noted, we're going to focus more on breadth rather than depth but there'll still be meaningful insights here. So I'm gonna be really sharing all the high value insights I've been providing to my portfolio, my businesses, on really how to act, and act in one week, two week, one month threshold, because that's the most meaningful stuff that we can do today. So really quickly, I'm, I'm probably fairly new to everyone here, so I wanna give just a quick personal introduction on kind of what my lens is, what my insight is, and what my background is. So, on my end, I, I really do come from more of a tech background and startup background. Um, this is just kind of a garbled resume. Um, but uh, really right now, my focus is on both With Much Love and the Tribe Group. These are organizations that are really helping early businesses navigate the zero to one, meaning how to start your business and how to scale it. And that's usually the most difficult part for most business owners and founders. So my investments range from not only technology startups, but also to restaurants, um, you know, direct SMB locations, retail and fashion. Really on my end, my goal is to really help support everyone. And that's really kind of where my lens and background comes in at. Aside from that, my history and my background is also within tech, where I've been a founder and CEO of a handful of technology startups, specifically in the mobile and consumer entertainment space. I've been lucky enough to raise capital. I've been a lucky enough to also exit companies as well. So that's kind of the lens I come in. I really want to build for scale. Aside from that, I have a really deep background in growth, user acquisition, and digital marketing. I have num uh, I've been able to play a role in a handful of number one global apps on the iOS and Android stores. And then more recently, I've also become kind of a CEO and executive coach for different founders and businesses, really just trying to help them navigate that zero to one as well. So whether it's a direct investor or an advisor relationship, it essentially becomes kind of a CEO coaching role. So I've supported over uh, $200 million in venture capital raise for over 12 different startups as well. So, you know, this is kind of where I come from. And really the great thing about me is I'm also somewhat local. Uh, I grew up in both Folsom and El Dorado Hills. And although I've been kind of in both Europe and San Francisco for the last 10 years, Folsom and El Dorado Hills is currently my home. So I do understand the local community to a certain extent, but I'm also still learning. So I'm hoping that, you know, with the insights I can share, I can take some insights from each and every one of you as well. So, let's just get into the insights and what really matters today. And I think you're gonna already have heard this quite a bit for all of your businesses, regardless of brick and mortar, enterprise, technology, it's all about extending your runway. Meaning how much time do you have to be able to deal with the current situation? And unfortunately, this is the most difficult task because it requires hard decisions. 
So really it's imperative for all local businesses to drastically reduce costs and extend runway in any manner possible, right? This means tough decisions on parting with staff, which is probably one of the most difficult things to do. It means, you know, putting off purchases and reevaluating stock requirements as well. So with all these kind of elements, it's important to recognize that you have to get really in the trenches here and understand your entire business needs. From there, how do you do this? How do you extend your runway? Well, I'm just going to give you a few of the tasks that I've been dealing with that are probably the most pertinent for you as well. When you look to your current cost structure, the most largest issue is rent. That probably comes first and foremost, especially after you go through parting. And really in this kind of scenario, it's understanding that how do you actually navigate and have this conversation with your tenant and landlord. So I tell every one of my partners in my portfolio, it's, you know, ask them a simple question. How can you help us during this time? Put the onus on of them to see how they react. It's really important because you need to understand from a negotiating perspective, what lens are they are. You know, some of your landlords are also being hit pretty hard, especially if their entire portfolio is in property right now. So sometimes they might have difficulty. Other, or other landlords, this might be a side hustle. So they might be willing to extend rent for a certain case because this is not their primary revenue stream. So once you understand that, you can then figure out what are the terms you can actually leverage and negotiate with this partner. So in this case, of course, the ideal thing is rent forgiveness. Um, I've already had a few of our landlords for different properties just provide full rent forgiveness. I'm also lucky enough to have a few investments in Europe and it's amazing over there right now because it's all frozen. All mortgages are frozen. There's no worries right now. But in the US, it's very different at the moment. So we're also nav navigating it. So about 30% of our landlords thus far have given full rent forgiveness for up to 90 days. It's pretty amazing, but of course, that's very rare. So what about the other 70% scenario? Well, ask for discounts, just basic discounts, anything that's getting off the cost structure, incredibly important. Again, we've seen flexibility of people offering between 25 to 50% discounts. Sure, it's still not everything, but it's something. And again, your key is to figure out how much you can claw. Next, ask if they're willing to access your security deposit for the next few months. Can they leverage that for the next two months payments, right? A few of our landlords have been open to this, or they're actually willing to give back that larger security deposit. And of course, it depends on what your current structure and lean is. Some people have really large security deposits, especially if you work in a business park or your tech startup, you sometimes have five to six months in your security deposit. So being able to access that is meaningful. But even if it's a small business and you only have one to two months rent, it's one to two months rent. So see if that's an opportunity to access as well. Next is kind of a lease extension barter agreement that we've seen work as well. It's the idea if they're willing to forgive these next three months, they're willing to add on three months to the lease as well. Especially considering most of these guys care about your business and if you're offering a lot of value to their property, meaning that you're a meaningful SMB with traffic or you have a deep relationship to the community, they're most likely going to be excited about this because they want you to stay longer. So in some cases, we've had the ability for people to do three month lease forgiveness for in order to extend our lease by another year. And it comes down to, again, where your landlord falls in. But again, another tactic on that negotiation. The last thing I highly recommend is banding together and getting a united front. If you work in the same business park or you have a cluster of same businesses that are under the same ownership, talk to your other tenants that are next to you and come together with a shared email. If you come with the united front, it becomes a very different conversation than someone managing one-offs. More importantly, once you understand all these needs, be able to provide a solution to your landlord. Some landlords aren't great at thinking creatively. So if you're able to walk through all of this and you can understand your needs, by being able to present them an actual decision making is gonna make it easier to get that yes or no. They just have to turn down or accept an offer. So just trying to think through all these different elements. So again, these are just really quick measures on how to negotiate on the landlord side because as mentioned, this is kind of where that first cost structure is really hitting a lot of businesses. Next, like negotiate terms with delayed payment structures if there's anything that pertains to your business. This is a lot harder for say restaurants because you really don't have this negotiation structure built in, but it's a lot easier for traditional B2B businesses here. Um, so if you're willing to ask and say, hey, or can we extend our payment structure or what we owe you to a net 60, net 90, net 180, again, you're also gonna a lot of the times get a little bit of a break. Um, in certain conversations we've seen, when it's a large-scale tech startup, we've been able to move to net 180. When it's small-scale um, small scale SMBs, we've been able to move to like net 30 or extend for 30 or 60 days. And again, that buys you time, and that's runway. 
anything you can do on that front is important. So it's recognizing, again, this is not incredibly high value, but it's offering optionality. So there's a, there's a reason for you to add that into the conversation. Next, like reach out to your banking institution, like you go call them first, your financial institution, whatever it is, and get their guidance on their updated offerings. You're gonna see a lot of these banks recognizing this as an opportunity for them to really offer community value. And especially in this area, you have a lot of local banks and credit unions who are willing to probably extend just based off history. So you wanna ask them basic questions. What are your credit line terms? What's your availability? What are the requirements for that? Also ask them very bluntly, what do I qualify for right now? Know what are the options in front of you in this moment to see what you can actually capture and access. More importantly, ask to be on their email list or phone list or whatever it is when a new offering comes through. Express to them you're very interested and you're willing to move fast. If they know that you're willing to have that conversation, they're more likely gonna come to you first. And this becomes important as we'll talk through a little bit later is that a lot of these funds are getting exhausted quickly. So you need to be top of funnel, top of mind, and be able to have that conversation. Separately, if you do have this conversation with the bank, you have to also recognize, talk to another bank, right? This is a business. See if there's an opportunity for you to have leverage for them to bring your history over. One of the greatest thing a lot of local SMBs offer is that you have a 10 or 20 year rooted history in this, in this community. Banks value that. They, they value the fact that there's predictability around your business. And most banks will recognize this is only a 90-day issue. So again, have more people in the conversation if you feel that you're getting railroaded by your current banking institution or financial partner. Of course, the, you want to start there because you're, that's who you owe your first payments to in most cases. But of course, if there's not a forward conversation, move somewhere else. I hate sharing this, it's not what my recommendation is, but there are good terms out there. Take advantage of 0% and low interest credit card offers or deferred credit card offers. You're seeing like no payments or 0% for 18 months. These are huge in this current scenario as well. And you're able to extend credit lines up to 20, 30, $40,000. I'm never a big fan of taking on more credit debt. But if you're able to get windows over 12 months and you understand the ROI predictability nature of your business, this can be a really good solution. I just would never take any of these deferred or 0% structures if they're less than 12 months. It needs to be more than 12 months, especially considering the unknown of the COVID impact. Also, I'd recommend you to look at business cards. You know, Chase is really well known in this community. I'd also look at a company called Brex, B-R-E-X. It's very new and specifically focused towards startups and just professional businesses. They give some of the best terms I've seen on credit line extensions. Essentially, if you have $10,000 in the bank, in most cases, they're willing to fund thirty dollars to $40,000 in a credit line on behalf of your business as well too. So they're very interesting, very new, and very, very flexible on structures. Um, there's a other handful of other competitors to Brex, including Divi, and we'll follow up with a few links on what those services are. Reach out, an application doesn't hurt in most cases, especially if you can find one or two to apply towards that are really going to give you the beneficial terms you need. So that's a lot of what I would recommend right now in extending runway, it's getting cash, right? But the other important thing is, if you're extending runway, you really need to understand how to meaningfully deploy capital. This is one of the biggest issues I tend to run, in through, run into with SMBs is that, most individuals don't know even how to meaningfully deploy capital, right? So the first thing you need to do, and this is the number you all should have on the back of your mind, is what's your clear hurdle and revenue milestone? Essentially, how much do I need to make every day, week, and month to clear the bare minimum with your new cost structure? So after making all the hard decisions in regard to you know, parting with staff, reducing costs, et cetera, you need to have a clear number of what that hurdle is, what you need to clear every month and how far, how fast, and how, what the velocity needs to be to get that. You need a target. If you don't have a target, you're flying blind. So with that, once you have that target, you need to then be able to answer the following question. How would I put 1,000 to use, 10,000 to use, 100,000 to use? Do you have good answers to these questions? Can you deploy this? And when I mean how do you use this, it's not like, oh, I need to pay off debt. That's not valuable in this conversation. The question is, is that with this new $1,000, $10,000 or $100,000 that comes in, what kind of ROI could I deliver or capture? And ROI standing for return on investment. 
So if I put a thousand, I can make 1500 net. That's interesting. That is something worth doing. And I could do it in X, Y, and Z. Same thing with 10K to 100K. Do you have good answers on that? And if you do, write these out. Make sure you can really talk this through. Because most banking partners, financial institutions are going to let you, uh, will recognize this is a huge opportunity for people. As awful as this situation is, the truth is, is that there's an opportunity to capture new market share, understanding how to navigate strong ROI. So the businesses that can present that are the ones who are really going to capture the best terms as well, too. So when you have that and you've been able to get your cost structure down, you've been able to extend your runway and you have no new uses of capital, the question now be begs is what are the new KPIs? And KPI standing for key performance indicators or key metrics, right? What are the metrics that your business now needs to update to? Because the entire landscape of the industry has changed, right? Uh, is if you're a restaurant, you're not a volume-based KPI anymore. It's not about filling in dining seats because no one's sitting in dining anymore at the moment. So your entire playbook's been thrown out and you have to figure out what your new KPIs for your business need to look like. So with volume and foot traffic down, right, for most of these businesses, the new metrics need to be two things right now, in my opinion. First is average order value or cart size, meaning that on average, how much is the customer who comes in is paying? So for most restaurants, it's usually between 10 to $20. In this case, right, you want to figure out how to move that as high as possible since you now have lower volume. The other thing you need to really do is understand your net margins. Uh, again, I, I, I reference restaurants quite a bit, but this pertains to any other business. Net margins tend to vary drastically across your product suites. Right. There are certain, you know, in certain restaurants, one meal could be 10 percent net margins and the other could be 40 percent. You need to know what those eat, what those are for every single thing you're doing. And you need to focus on the ones that have the best net margins because that's what you need to push. Net margins matters more than anything else. I rather do a thousand dollars in net margins than ten thousand dollars in revenue with five hundred dollar net margin on that. Right. It's understanding net margins is what you're able to take home. And that's what you need to optimize in a smaller scenario here. So what does that look like? And how do you do this really quickly? And again, this is very wide funnel. I, I wish we could go more detail, but for every sector, it's different. So for average order value and cart size, you want to generally think about bundles. How do you group three or four or five like-minded items? If you do have data and, you know, whether digital data or your own retail data or in-store data, see what are people buying together and then bundle that up as an offering. So it's very simple. Your bundle should be starting at $50 at a minimum upwards to $100 at, you know, at, at least. That's kind of the really sweet spot. Uh, in current traditional pricing structures, whether you're digital or retail, it's 20, 50, 100. Those are the three bundle price points you want to walk a customer up. Um, so in this case, I'd skip 20, um, but depending, you know, if your average order size is a dollar, then 20 is going to be a really high element, but 50 to hundred is really that sweet spot. Other ways to do that is, you know, home kits. What are elements that people are now can use at home and be able to buy to supply for an entire week or a day? Is it a week of food? Is it a day of food? Is it a meal of food, right? For family ordering, figure out what are the best ways you can increase the average order value, right? The other way to do this is kind of the old school McDonald's philosophy. It's add-ons. Um, so the biggest and highest profitable thing that McDonald's once had was the simple phrase was, do you want to biggie size that? Right? It was the idea for 49 cents, you could add it on. But the amazing thing on that 49 cent add-on or whatever the price point was you know, now, um, they were getting almost 30 to 40% pure net margin off that. So similarly, when people are buying, you need to ask verbally in store, would you like to add on X, Y, or Z? Make sure you know what that X, Y, and Z add-on should be. It should usually be about 25 to 30% of the order size. So if someone is buying something for $100, you should be offering them an add-on for 25 to 30. It's very easy for them to slide, slide that in as well and push the margins up. Same thing on digital. As they're starting to check out, hey, do you know we have a limited time discount on this $30 item, $20 item? Try pricing it dynamically. And of course, that's a little hard if you don't have a digital presence yet. 
but you can just physically do that yourself with just simple recommendations. When you're on the phone with an order, you're talking to a customer for your, you know, your direct sales business, whatever it may be, this is kind of the opportunity here for you guys in order to scale and really push that average order value up. Net margins. Really quickly here on net margins, the biggest thing to understand is you need to identify your high margin products. If you don't know what your top three ones are right now, you know, you're already failing your business. More importantly, you want to correlate that with the highest sellers as well. So there's kind of a balance there, right? You might have a 90% high margin product that no one buys. Okay, well, let's not focus on that. Let's focus on essentially what are your top 10 best sellers? And of those top 10 best sellers, what are the three highest margins and average order value? So there's a little bit of an art to it, but that's kind of the rudimentary science to it. And if you could kind of line up those numbers, that's the best way to do it. Because what you want to do then is that, you know, if you have a website or if people are coming in store, you should position those first three things right there. You should be buying this because this actually helps my business the most. Gift cards, same thing, right? Like this is pure net margins. This is the greatest thing ever. If anything, this is the number one thing I recommend, but how do you do it? I'm sure you've already been told gift cards over and over and over again, but this is what you need to do. You need to incentivize gift card purchases and you also need to communicate them to the, that value to the customer. So how do you incentivize it? Well, again, I'd go back to that 20, 50, 100 thesis I shared with you earlier and say, let's focus on 50 to 100. I'd focus on those gift card sizes right now and I'd offer a 20% value on top of it. So if you buy a $50 gift card, we will give you a $10 value item for free on top of that. You know, if you make pies, great. Whatever that service is, if you just sell anything digital, same thing. Buy our $50 package, we'll give you a $10 PDF, something like that. The great thing here is that A, you're incentivizing the highest net margins, which are most important to your business because technically gift cards are 100% net, net margin in the near term. Of course, with redemption, it changes. But essentially, that's super essential for your core business. The other great thing is the add-on you're adding on top of that, whatever it's $10 or $20 thing, you also have 50% net margins in that. So you're really only giving them $3 or $5 worth of additional cost to your business. And that's something you can easily sweat, but it's perceived at that $10 value to the customer, right? So, you know, if I were, you know, a bakery, I do a $100 gift card and you get one of our pies for, you know, $20 pies for free. And I know my cogs on that pie is probably four to six dollars or eight dollars, whatever it may be. That's the only cost I'm technically eating there. And that's what's really compelling to do. So you should showcase that as a limited time offer, but you should also communicate that to your customer. Tell them this is the best way to help me. And you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that communication strategy. Lastly, if you're a business with consumable products, this is amazing. Push this out. Get this at very low cost because a consumable product, meaning a product once they use, they have to buy again, is a recurring customer. So essentially what you wanna do, this has huge net margins and net recurring margins, which is incredibly valuable. So if you have a consumable offering, try to present that first and do it as a loss leader on the first one. Meaning that you know if it usually costs $10 for this consumable product and you make $5 net margins on it, Sell that first one for like $3, $4, lose a little bit of money because you know it's consumable. And if you have some of that data and we could talk through about that recurring customer, you're going to make it up in the long run because these customers are going to buy through you consistently, consistently, consistently. So it's just understanding, of course, with your business model, what that consumable offering is. And again, these are broad strokes. So try understanding how to adapt these to your businesses as well. Next, probably the most important thing that I think everyone needs to do is explore digital opportunities. Everyone needs to understand how to go online in this world. There's one metric that's working. There's one business that's working. Those are digital first businesses right now in our current economy. App downloads are up and to the right. Um, you know, uh, user engagement's up and to the right. Everything's working. And the truth is most SMBs, especially in this region, don't have a sophisticated digital strategy. So now is the time to start investing in that and seeing what you can do. So there's, of course, a long-term investment of building an entire digital storefront. Um, but there's, more importantly, these low-hanging fruits that you can take advantage of and deploy now. And we're going to talk through more of that in the near term. So, you know, brick-and-mortar businesses need to emphasize three major things right now. It's e-commerce, digital branding and social identity, and online customer capture. Uh, because we don't know how long this is going to be, there's an opportunity that this is 30, 60, 90 days, whatever it may be. You want to start capturing that digital user so that they're still communicating with your brand. 
you still want to be able to reach them out to them with digital branding social media you want to sell them through your e-commerce store and have revenue coming direct to you as well but of course all this is really difficult to like launch today so what are those low-hanging fruits you can deploy so I know most restaurants and, and companies hate these services, but we're gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be their pitch man for just 30 seconds, and I'm gonna show you how you could leverage them in your favor. So like Uber Eats, DoorDash, Postmates, Grubhub, I think there's even a couple more locally here as well. You should be utilizing these if you do not have a service already. But here's the issue. They take huge, huge margins, and I recognize that. And they usually kill your net margins. So what do you do? you play them, you play the game against them. You create a new menu just for that platform with your A, highest margin opportunities, and B, even increase the price by a dollar to two dollars there. All your core customers who already know your brand will come directly to you, but what's even more important here is that uh, you will be able to attract new users, and that's what's really valuable on these platforms. It's the millennial kids who still want to just download something and uh, get something shipped directly to their home. They're using these platforms in a day-to-day -day basis. So it's important to know that you don't have to put your entire menu there. You've already done the hard work of knowing your highest margin property, so put that there. Also, more importantly, allow for bulk processing. If you start recognizing, say, you have a curated lunch menu you put on Postmates with only five offerings or three offerings, whatever it may be, make sure it's the ones that you could uh, like, you know, produce in batches, right? Whether you're a restaurant or if you have some type of physical good, allow for the idea where it's bulk processing so you can, again, get more margins, right? If you cook 10 chickens at the same time, you save labor costs, whatever it may be. There's really interesting ways to navigate on this front. So the key is really understanding and recognizing that you just have to play the game in order to capture that user base. And of course, your entire revenue is not going to be coming from them, but it could be 20% of the revenue. Because what is the goal here? The goal is to survive. It's to clear that hurdle. So do whatever you can. And the amazing thing about these platforms is they solve for everything. They give you a digital storefront. They have an existing user base. And they solve for delivery. All you have to do is prep the food, put it in a bag, and get out of the way. So again, don't put your whole menu. Still have exclusivity for the stuff that's high value to you. Only put your high margin products on there that you're able to at least get that back. And the other thing you should do if you have the conversation opportunity is call these guys directly. Uber Eats, DoorDash, Postmates, Grubhub all offer the same thing. They're all technically commodities and they're fighting versus one another. So if you have a meaningful brand, you could actually negotiate on the commission structure. I've been able to drop commissions by 50% from these guys by just talking to them. So you say, hey, I'll go exclusively on the DoorDash platform if you drop commissions for the first 90 days. Right. That could be an interesting way to have that conversation. Some will push back. Absolutely true. And all the terms kind of vary here. But right now, what I've seen for a lot of platforms is that, you know, Uber Eats, DoorDash and Postmates have way more volume. Grubhub has the best terms, but Grubhub does not push enough volume. In this case, I'd really be deferring to Uber Eats, DoorDash and Postmates. More specifically, Uber Eats and DoorDash in this region seem to be the strongest thus far. But again, you guys probably will have other partners who know this stuff and they can share that data back to you. So again, negotiate, 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 and really build for that platform directly. So if you put a limited five thing menu or items, right? It doesn't have to just be food. I'm sorry, I keep going back to food since it's very easy to talk through. But yeah, if you sell anything, right? Sell the most essential needs on here. Make sure you have margins. Make sure you build in for margins. And then you could also optimize for portion control as well if you're on the food side. Right. If you make your food 20 percent smaller, you get 20 percent more margin because they're built for delivery to go. So, again, just be ethical in regard to what you think is best for your brand and business, but ensure that you're still doing this profitably. Next, update your digital presence, like get high quality menus. It's actually incredibly surprising how poor a lot of these businesses are. I literally go to a lot of local businesses and I can't find their menu. They're super outdated. They require weird installs for PDF views. No, like make this stuff super simple and easy. And if you haven't used this amazing site called canva.com, it's free. You can create high quality menus in less than five minutes having no digital sophistication. It's as simple as using Microsoft Word. It's really compelling. So update your menus, make sure that it's there, right? Get updated photos. If there's anything you should be paying for right now, like go get a decent photographer, $50, 
prep all your food and get amazing lighting of your actual shots of your photos if you don't have this yet. Super easy ROI return. Everyone wants to see gorgeous stuff and gorgeous value. Also take a few photos of your restaurant, of your location, of your process, of how you know, clean this uh, whole process is. You know, highlight limited time discounts as we talked about earlier, whether it's the gift card discounts or hey, any orders over $100 get a 10% discount. Any weekly orders get you know, 20% discounts. Figure this out and find that balance so you could push that through. Lastly, support your social media platforms. It doesn't matter if you don't have a presence now, just recognize that is how discovery is happening today. People are literally going to Google and typing in businesses. So any way that you could land in front of them, have your social media platforms up. Customers wanna see an active business. Customers wanna see new stuff coming out. Customers wanna see rotating menus. You could easily play that up with just simple images, simple photos, and simple text. This is all stuff that any business owner can do. Instagram and Facebook are the best right now. If you have a Yelp platform, again, update accordingly. Send a message, show an updated menu. You should control your Yelp page as well. All these are really easy wins and you could usually do them in all in one day and then deploy to all the platforms the next, right? So again, low hanging fruit that you can easily do. So again, lots of information there already, but the, you know, the big key here now is how do you be proactive every day? This is probably the most important information that you know, I want to share with everyone is you need to be dynamic for your business needs, right? You need to be ready to jump on new opportunities at any given moment. Allowing for a little dynamic decision-making goes far in the current climate. And I know this is kind of orthogonal to most people's perspective. You know, a lot of people I work with and talk with, they kind of have their, their approach for the next six years or six months. But the idea is that if you could allow for 10% of your decision-making to be dynamic, you could really allow for the new opportunities coming in. And the reason it's super important is because of the current climate. Everything's shifted. Everything's changing. We don't know where capital is coming from. We don't know how long this is lasting for. The element is that is that rather than making rooted hard decisions that you cannot escape from, allow for that dynamic layer where you could take uh, you know, advantage of any opportunities that come through. So you know, what does that look like? Well, you need to be aware of local loans and offerings. This is probably going to be the most like biggest value period right now. So, you know, you have SBA.gov, you have federal loans, you have local loans, you know, be up to date. Like today, the Senate's actually voting probably in the next hour on hopefully passing one of the largest loan packages, stimulus packages. It's going to give like roughly like $1,200 to $1,500 per person. That's not what you care about. What you care about is they're right now putting $500 billion together for small business loans. And that's the most interesting element. And you want to be aware as soon as that opens up, when that's going to be available, because then you have predictability against your business as well. You also want to be aware of the local opportunities, especially because those dry up way faster than anything else, right? Outside of that, there's a lot of text here, but start building your application now. Like start getting your answers ready today. Answer all these questions and have them in a text file that you could copy paste and edit accordingly. You do the 80% hard work now and the 20% will be easier because really it's a first come first serve platform. That's unfortunate, but that's your opportunity. So answer, how has COVID-19 impacted your business? Like walk through, show details, show your data, you know, talk through what value does your business offer to the community so that there's a real relationship. What is your business mission? How do you use the capital? As we talked about earlier, who are recommendations you can provide? Who are business leaders who would represent you, right? Be able to showcase that you're connected. Share and collect all of the press links around your business, right? Like have those ready to go. So you can put like, oh, here's a local business article from you know, the chamber. Here's a local business article from Comstock. Here's a local business article from SACP. Make sure that people can see that because the truth is a lot of the people who are gonna be reviewing these loans are just doing top of funnel evaluation. And what I mean by that is they're just clicking three or four things to make sure you're real, make sure you have value and you're good because they have to get this out. They're so backed up. So the more professional your offering and your package looks like, the more likelihood you're going to be able to convert on loan structures as well, too. Lastly, update that website, right? All this should connect. You shouldn't have an outdated piece or element to your business. And this is, again, a major issue. You can look really great in your application, but guess what? What is the first thing these guys are going to do? It's go to your website because that's the easiest way to understand your brand. And if it looks like it's still in the 1990s or it's not updated with the relevant information of who you are, you have a disconnect. And disconnect will decrease your chances of being able to convert on any of these opportunities and loan structures as well too. As I noted, these things dry up fast and that's why it's super important to be actionable. 
So like Sacramento announced an emergency relief program of a million dollars that was gone in two days. Like it's over. You can't even submit uh, applications anymore. It went out last week and it was gone. And the truth is, is that you also have to recognize a million at $25,000 a piece is only 40 businesses, 40 businesses in the entire greater Sacramento region. That's crazy. That, that's, how is that even supporting? What you have to recognize is you have to do everything in your power to be one of those 40. And that's kind of the key here is that recognizing these programs are going to keep coming out. And they're going to come out in small dosages because, again, local industries or local councils tend to struggle on knowing how to deploy capital correctly. So for those of you who might be near Roseville or have Roseville partners, they just announced their one million program yesterday. And it goes up tomorrow on applications. So if you're a Roseville business, be ready because you should be literally applying in the first 15 minutes. The best way I could explain this is like, say, if you have a favorite band or concert you really want to go to and you want to get the best seats. The key is you can't wait. You literally have to wait as soon as tickets open up to be able to grab those seats. It's no different here for the loans. This is how uh, you know, aggressive the competition is right now. So if you have all the information and you're aware of the dates, you can really deploy this quickly and validly in order to capture that capital as well. Next, like take COVID-19 seriously and showcase to customers, right? Showcase that you actually understand the risks and fears and you're going above and beyond to deliver value still to your community because it matters, right? So when I say go above and beyond, like showcase your health standards. Like there are a lot of great businesses who've gone like really far by getting you know, extra sanitizers, you know, wearing gloves, washing hands every 30 minutes, wiping down counters two to three X more every day. But you got to communicate that because I'm not in your business. I don't see that. But if I hear about that and you're showcasing me what your process is, I have a larger trust relationship with you, especially for those who have, you know, a larger risk to COVID-19 because they still need food. They still need deployment. So it's, again, this relationship structure you need to be able to build in order to really be able to garner their trust. Right. So thoughtfulness goes far here. Right. So say if you are a business that can you know, take curbside orders. Make the curbside order the least touch point process ever, right? The idea is that you come out with gloves, you have a dynamic way where they enter the chip, you never touch their card. Think through that, right? Where they're in and out in five minutes without any physical contact. Because if that works, the word of mouth on that goes really, really, really far. I've seen a lot of businesses do this incredibly successfully in San Francisco as they were one of the first kind of shelter at home kind of cities in the California to kind of go into that structure. So they're already a month ahead of us in terms of how they've been reacting. So if you look at the local business there, the ones that are thriving are the ones that A, have communicated that, have shared in social media how they've responded to COVID, talk about what they're doing to prepare for it, to support their employees, and also make it so turnkey to still buy from them and build that relationship, right? So, you know, whether it's like lunch packs, right? They showcase how they pack their lunch. They did a 30 second video of everyone with gloves, a clean counter tray, showcasing it all getting packed, put into a bag and ready to go. Very, very crisp, very clean. And they were actually able to do a high in revenue for that business all time, that day when it went out just because of how much people cared about that. They hit their net high during COVID. That's crazy. But that's the recognition of what the opportunity in this landscape is if you're proactive and you move fast. As noted, communicate. Communicate this all out. Text, video, blogs, photos, whatever medium that you care about or you're, you're great with, use it and share it. Post it wherever you can. Let people know that you're doing this every single day. This is the greatest time ever in terms of time on your hands. It kind of sucks, but it's kind of awesome in terms of you could actually deploy these strategies for the first time and update this across both digital and physical. So when you come in, you're up, you know, if you're in a physical store and people ask and you have a high touch location, you tell them like, hey, we just wiped down our counters. We'll be doing that every two hours. We want to make sure everything's protected. Let us know if we could help you with anything or if you have any needs. Just that as a simple welcoming changes the entire conversation of the trust factor between you and their business. And that's really important on the physical side. And of course, extend on the digital side. So you get foot traffic coming through to a certain extent. Redesign your physical space so it's designed for people to flow in and flow out quickly. Create structures where you don't allow more than five people into your store because you care. It's not because of the customer relationship. You want to understand that COVID is serious as well too. So all these elements go really far, but you need to showcase it, share it, really detail it with any of the individuals who interact with your brand. Next, like talk authentically with your customers, like really show, showcase how they can help you, right? This is the most difficult thing people still forget. Like tell your customers directly what is the best way they can help you. 
Customers need guidance so they understand what is the most valuable thing for your business, right? So have clear recommendations, right? So that's why it's like, hey, to best help us right now, we'd appreciate people buying gift cards because this allows us to have clear net margins, cover our costs, and be able to support our businesses. Or hey, the best way you can help us is continue to buy your current you know, structure every week if you can through us or do pre-orders so that we can essentially be able to meet demand needs and aggregate accordingly as well too. So I think these are kind of all the areas where you need to actually share, share how they can help you, tell them directly, right? And that could be a landing page where, you know, as soon as they come to your website, you have a quick text, it's an Instagram post, like, hey, these are the three ways you could best help our business. Share this post, buy a gift card or, you know, uh, buy a meal pass, all right? Or, hey, support your, uh, our business needs doing X, Y, and Z. If you have clear recommendations, you're going to get better conversion. Lastly, it's like, you know, take advantage of free and discounted services that are coming out. Um, and, and, and we want to continue to update this on your guys' behalf at Compass. But in short, like, there's a lot. So be aware of this first one. It's the one I recommend to everyone. Facebook is creating $100 million in grants and ad credits, right? If you go to, you know, facebook.com forward slash business forward slash boost forward slash grants, uh, and again, we'll send these links out. These are all long URLs and they get longer in the next few. Uh, essentially, right, you could get pure grant loans with no interest or deferred costs or ad credits to start doing your first digital ad spends to get the digital customer. This is one of the largest programs already been put out and they'll be hopefully launching this next week. So go look at the website, see what the requirements are. Make sure you have all your information so you can apply because Facebook put this out last week. So that everyone knows and they're starting to prep for the next two weeks on this. So make sure you have all your applications ready to go and sign up for their update. Be sure that you're gonna be the one of the first people to get their emails. Next, if you have a Yelp presence of any sort, Yelp's announced 25 million in free upgrades and services. Not hugely valuable, but take advantage of it, right? Getting more presence on Yelp is important. Yelp's metrics are up and th to the right as well too. Uh, the, of course, revenue is down in terms of actual in-store takeout and dine, but digital presence is really high. People are still going to the Yelp website in order to understand. So again, you can go to this link, you can see how you can free upgrade your account, be able to communicate, be able to do curbside pickup there as well too, because those tend to have very low commission structures as well, so you can still continue your business. So if you don't have a curbside or any type of delivery structure, Yelp can easily do that. And again, free upgrade services. Smaller stuff, right? Like if you want to learn and read, like I really recommend this to everyone. Just like spend 30 minutes to an hour a day reading something, whatever it is around your business and how to be better. There's amazing books, amazing knowledge, et cetera. So Scribd is one of these larger platforms that is essentially offering 30 days free reading and learning of all their audio books, all their magazines, et cetera. No credit card required. You can literally click the link, you get it. Just try learning. If you could spend 30 minutes during your commute on some type of new education, it's gonna be helpful and meaningful to your business. And afterwards, we'll send a recommendation of all the best business books around on Scribd that's available for you today. If you're a little bit more tech savvy and really wanna be able to increase your flow, Zapier is one of the interesting platforms. It's called an IFTTT platform, if this, then that. Long, long story short, what it is, it allows you to automate a few actions. So say if someone signs up, on your website via email, Zapier can then automatically send them an email on your behalf as soon as they sign up. So you don't have to manage any of that. And the great, there's a whole bunch of other weird ways that they could connect. The tool is actually really powerful when you get into it. So if you have a little tech sophistication, really good to do this. Uh, separately, if you're like a, um, you know, anyone with Adobe Creative Suite or utilize any of those tools, if you literally just email Adobe uh, about your current situation, they'll most likely waive your fees for the creative suite for 30 to 90 days as well too. So if you're in marketing, digital, anything like that, it's very easy to do that. You just have to send them an email. They just need to hear like, hey, my business is being impacted. Is there any way I could save on services right now? And they'll defer you for 30 to 90 days, totally free. So again, communicating and sharing this with different partners, you'll probably get the same for any tech service or tool you're using communicate with that tool and hopefully there might be some discount, some structure, or at least a free upgrade because people are more incentivized than ever to be able to provide that to each businesses here today. So that was a lot. I'm sorry, it kind of feels like we just kind of threw everything onto you, but hopefully there are quite a few actionable insights that pertain to your business. As noted, this is more, a little bit more on breadth rather than depth, right? And really the next few webinars are gonna go into those details. So. On Friday, we're gonna be moving into the conversation around, specifically around 
how do we support restaurants and brick and mortar restaurants because that's the largest impact. So we'll even go deeper into how do you negotiate the terms between all these delivery services? How do you set up your own curbside? What is the right way to build margins within your own business as well too? We'll really try getting into the details where you have negotiation leverages with all these different companies so that you can really scale.